Hey everybody, this is BB and this is the Chop It Up show. This is a special edition episode. We have the team from Harlem Capital here. Ooh. What's going on? How's it going? Chilling, chilling, chilling. So we got Friday. HPJ, <laughs> Henri Pierre Jacques, and then we also have Jared Tingle. Guys, introduce yourselves. Hey guys, I'm Henri, uh, originally from Detroit. Live with this guy, Brandon, the for D. four years uh, in Harlem. Before uh, going to school in Boston, I live with this guy, Jared. What's going on? And I'm Jared from South Jersey, outside of Philadelphia. Known Henri from way back. Used to work together at our private equity firm and been working with these guys for a couple of years now. Awesome, awesome. So you guys are right now at Harvard Business School on a summer, well, not summer internship, but just summer break. And you yeah. guys were the first fun, I'm included in that, to ever <laughs> have the Harvard Fellowship where you get an opportunity to be paid by Harvard to work on your company. It's pretty, so, pretty blessed. Yeah, super, super blessed. And so today's episode, we're going to talk about a lot of FAQs, like frequently asked questions about Harlem Capital in general. And so we'll jump right into it. The first question is, how did we meet as a team? Yep. Right? And I think that we all met back at MLT. 2011. Yeah. Management yeah. Leadership for Tomorrow. So if you are an undergrad and you are, I guess, a sophomore in school, yep. um, or if you are looking to pursue an MBA, you should look at Management Leadership for Tomorrow because it's for underrepresented folks uh, and women yep. who are looking to get into business. And looking to build a community and they are top performers at their university so that's where we initially met do you remember the first impression <laughs> <laughs> i don't remember the first impression um so i didn't go to the first conference because i was studying abroad and right. then i met uh brandon and jared at the second conference they mm -hmm. do three conferences was that in a year actually minneapolis, I think. yeah target. minneapolis <laughs> yeah, target um and we really me and brandon really didn't get close until yeah we henry was together. wearing a yellow dress shirt with a red tie <laughs> so we were not we were i remember not, you called me out on that too we were not mixing <laughs> uh i can't remember my first impression of, of, of jerry all the wharton so all the like harvard guys hang, <laughs> hung together all the wharton guys hang together sounds about right and then yeah. my buddy me and you were midwest me we were midwest so i gave you a little break uh justin sullivan and i who went to ohio state were pretty wild cards for management <laughs> leadership for tomorrow uh, but anyways, we end up interning together as sophomores in New York. We end up interning um, on it, doing banking together, so or junior year, and then we also went full time. Actually, lived with Jared junior summer. Right. Yeah, so yeah. Summer. So you so guys, actually, I can talk about first impressions. Yes, please. Yeah, so there you go. <laughs> Excuse us. So I didn't have much about Brandon, but um, definitely realized this guy was well dressed, well put together. <laughs> I think he had a custom suit on or something like yes, that. Yes, so of course. That was pretty good, but no other thoughts. <laughs> Henri, I actually don't remember meeting Henri at the conferences, yeah, I don't but my first interaction with him uh, when was, was it? This was via Facebook. So he was looking for a roommate in the Facebook group. Like, hey, we have four roommates already looking for one more who wants mm -hmm. to live with us in, you know, Hell's Kitchen or Times Square area. Yeah. And I jumped on it. And I was like, this guy must be, you know, aggressive. Going at it. <laughs> and it proved out to be true. <laughs> yeah, it proved out to be true. And then actually uh, on that. So we intern as sophomores we interns as juniors and then we go full-time jared you found your roommate from mlt correct yep, yep. and then Henri and i found each other from mlt mm -hmm. as well and i at first i did not want to room with Henri, <laughs> but just like jared said like i was like man this guy this guy there's something to this guy and so we end up living by each other in harlem and how do we find each other investing together like what was that going yep. on and just to uh, put the pin in there right there Henri called everybody because he had a, re a really cool opportunity to invest in a company. And tell us that process. Yeah, so I remember it was uh, December of 2015. The stock market wasn't doing as well. I was pretty pissed. I was like, I'm tired of you know, losing money and having no control over these decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and Jared sat next to me uh, at my private equity firm that we were working at. And I turned to him. I was like, hey, Jared, like, would you be willing to put in a couple thousand dollars and like, do what we're doing for our firm for ourselves? He's like, yeah, sure. So I texted you. Mm -hmm. uh, you responded like, sure. He texted his roommate, who's one of our former partners, and then we texted another guy who we did MLT with, and then literally within 30 minutes, you know, we had five five guys who wanted to put yeah. in a couple thousand dollars. All and, five and do this. from MLT, and all lived in Harlem, and all lived in Harlem. Yeah. Wow. And so that's not necessarily where Harlem Capital started. It's that not. was just, hey, do you have X amount of dollars to put towards investing together? Yeah. How does it go from 
that of almost just like an angel syndicate to Harlem Capital or just like fill us in between those two. I'll let Jared kick that off because we our first meeting was in Jared's living room. Right. <laughs> yeah, so I think at first we just had like a text group or something like that. Mm-hmm. So we were just going back and forth thinking about deals. Uh, but I think at some point we realized, hey, if we're actually going to invest together. We need to have processes in place. We need to do diligence. We mm-hmm. need to have a way for meeting founders and having follow-up meetings. So we got together, I think still in December, in my mm-hmm. living room. December pretty big living 2015. Room in yeah, December 2015. <laughs> Pretty big living room, got some snacks and stuff. Yep. And then we just, you know, got together and decided like, hey, this is what we're gonna do. Um, and then we started having just formal agendas. And so the first thing was just having a, a process for meeting every two weeks, I believe mm-hmm. it was, to at least get on the phone and talk through deals yeah. and what we wanted. Carving to do. out two hours or so. Yeah. yeah. And at the time, I don't think we we didn't come up with an official name. We were playing around with. We things. had Slate Ventures. We had Wiring. 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 Ventures. Certain people <laughs> will know what <laughs> people will know what Wiring is. We cannot say that on on the mic today. Uh, but yeah, so we were building our processes. The number one was just like carving out time to meet together. How do we start thinking about evaluating deals? Like, what, what was the process of us continually to build the ideas around what the heck Harlem Capital actually is? Yeah, I mean, I think we're pretty fortunate that, you know, Jerry and I worked at a private equity firm. Mm -hmm. We looked at, you know, a number of deals every week. And so we're like, hey, why don't we just take this booklet and use it for our private investments as well? Mm -hmm. And so we literally like just took the same framework. What is the criteria that, you know, the private equity firm uses? What should we use? Obviously, it's different when you're investing in earlier stage companies, Mm -hmm. um, but you should have certain criteria that you kind of hold yourself accountable for whether or not you want to make the investment. Wow. I mean, I even think that we can even step farther back to like, so we created the weekly or bi-weekly meeting. We created a Google Drive Mm -hmm. where we housed every single thing possible. So we took all the like collateral that you brought over from ICV and we started using it for ourselves. Uh, what else did we start doing? We had a drive for only deals. We had a drive for internal processes, marketing, branding, what have you. We started grabbing, um, I think we started reaching out for our LLC yeah, yeah. and like forming that. And, and that, that's wow. a critical step. That is it. And it's not and it's not a hard step. A lot of people always ask like, I've got a business in my house. I want to you know make it formal, I have an LLC. And I think... Mm-hmm. People think that there's like some LLC office. It's it's not that challenging. Uh, we were pretty fortunate where um, I just asked my mom like, "Hey, who do you use to make your LLC?" Mm-hmm. And obviously, it's more expensive when you have somebody do it. But in order for you to you know spend eight hundred dollars to thousand dollars and not have to worry about it and have them do all the documents, it's, worth it. it's well worth it. And mm-hmm. so I think if you find the right people, ask people who have LLCs, like you can you can pay for that process right. to be done. And is that they're they're technically called an agent, I believe. Yeah, a right? registered agent. So mm-hmm. like we're registered in Delaware, mm-hmm. but because our business isn't based there, you need to have some company that's a registered agent in that state to kind of like vouch for you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, cool. And then what, what goes on in LLC process? Like what does, what are the entities inside of their operating agreements and shares and blah, blah, blah. Did you want to touch on that for like just a hot second? Yeah. I mean, it's just, you have the operating agreement. Um, once you have the LLC, you get a, a, a federal like employee number, which is like your social security for your mm-hmm. business. And then that's what you use for taxes, your taxes and your forms. But besides that, you'll get a binder and, you know, you'll have certificates. But oh, a, lot of not, <laughs> a lot of it's just not important. Uh, so, like, there, there's not much much to it, really. Mm-hmm. Maybe it would be helpful if you took, like, a 30,000-foot view and just said, like, what the LLC is supposed to do. Yeah. Go into it. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> there we go. My understanding of an LLC uh-huh. um, is an entity you make for businesses. Essentially, what does it stand for? Limited Liability Corporation. Mm-hmm. And essentially, you're making it so that this business whatever it is, is going to live within this entity and it will be like kind of standalone. And mm-hmm. as a result, if there's liabilities or expenses or you go bankrupt, the government or your lenders, whoever can't come after your personal right. assets. And another feature is that it allows you to expense things. So if you think about going to a job and working, right, mm-hmm. um, you take home your income and then everything you have to buy. So your rent, your, your car insurance, your food mm-hmm. comes out of your, your, your net income. Right. For a business, though, um, you have your, your revenue from your operations. Mm-hmm. You can expense everything that you have to do to keep those operations going. And then you're only taxed on those profits. Right. So it kind of gives you uh, another way mm-hmm. to to you know arrange your, your P&L in a better yeah. way. Better flexibility. And what happens is you don't actually, with the LLC, you don't get taxed at the company level. Mm-hmm. Um, all the individual partners 
end up getting taxed individually on their personal tax returns. Awesome. So basically, it comes in like any income you would get for your job. Wow. Wow. Okay, cool, cool, that's, cool. That's MD Tinger right there. In, in, <laughs> managing director, Jared Tinger. <laughs> and one more point I want to add. Cause I'm, cause Ain't I'm going, finished I'm yet. I'm going at it, not finished. I think it's important. Um, so even if you have these legal structures in place, ultimately you want to get in the business or invest with people that you trust. Mm-hmm. Because there's it doesn't protect you from everything. You're still going to be exchanging money. You still have to do a lot of things on good faith. And so you have to make sure you know the people well, or at least you know have a high level of confidence in their integrity and ability to, to do what they say they're going to do. Cool, cool, cool. Wow, wow, wow. So Harlem Capital, we're at the point where we have the LLC, we created Harlem Capital. Um, we are about to start investing together. How do we go from the LLC to finding a deal and actually putting all of our own money together and sending it and wiring it to the company? Yeah, so... <laughs> I mean, our first deal uh, was called Seed CX. Mm-hmm. Came across from a friend of a friend who also went to Northwestern uh, University, such as me. And then we kind of all met. We discussed it. Eventually, once we got you know comfortability well, with the deal. Well, how do we get comfortable? I think that may be like yeah, a cool so, I mean, thing. Yeah, so the process um, for us was it, it's uh, – I don't want to get into the, the, bit, the deal because it's kind of more technical. But mm-hmm. we got really comfortable with the industry. So I think you have to be comfortable with the industry. Mm-hmm. Is it growing? You know, you think it comes with the competitors. So do you think that this product is better than, than other products out there on the market? Mm-hmm. Are you comfortable with the management team? So the two founders went to MIT, uh, very smart guys. The guy who introduced me, he also has a fund. He was really smart. And so you come to with the, the founders themselves. Um, and then, like, what is your kind of appetite for risk, right? It right. Was, so I think, you know, venture obviously is a risky asset class. And are you willing to kind of take that risk? And do you believe that this business is worth it? And once mm-hmm. we got to that point, it was each of us decision to decide how much money do we want to put in. Right. right. So that's the beauty of an angel fund is that you don't all have to put in the same amount of money. So based on certain deals, if you like it or you don't like it, you can put in less, or you can put in more. Generally, we wanted every partner to at least put in something in order for us to really put it underneath the LLC. Yep. And then we would we would invest uh, just through the LLC. So there's one name that kind of gets put on the cap tables, so mm-hmm. to speak. And that's a good point you brought up there is that like. When in an LLC, there's like comfortability and there's trust between folks. And so everyone doesn't have to put in the same amount of money, say if we're doing fifteen, twenty five thousand dollars $25,000. You can go back and forth of who's putting in what. But what happens is that, um, what was I going to say? Everyone gets their respective shares as yeah. well. And so you have your respective ownership. And then we also put in place for us that we had a minimum. So if you yeah. were, if we were writing X amount of dollars, minimum of the five people someone has put in this amount just to make it fair for everyone else you can't put in one dollar and yep. someone's <laughs> putting in six thousand and so, so that was something that we had to go back and forth with and yeah then, we didn't start with that that came later yeah and then <laughs> another thing i was going to jump in and say is that we also had to go and get a business bank account so these are all things that people should be taking notes of get your llc get comfortable with people get your operating agreement get your bank account so that you can wire money between just one from A to B. And and then now we're going to fast track. We did a few deals. And now we're thinking about having, um, now we're thinking about fundraising. Yeah. I think it is important to talk about our first deal from a different perspective, though. Oh, okay. I think one thing that worked out well for us, um, our first deal was coming from an established VC mm, firm. Yes. Right? And so we actually got it through another guy who was, he had allocation or mm-hmm. the opportunity to invest, you know, several hundred thousand of dollars. And then he was syndicating it out. So basically he was looking for a bunch of individuals or angels to fill the round. And what made this a good first deal for us is that there was a lot of like homework and research already done. Mm-hmm. They already came with a memo. And so we didn't have to do everything from scratch. We already saw how somebody who had been investing for a while thought about it. And as a result, it was a kind of a good like yep. kind of launch pad into it. I think another approach we could have taken was mm-hmm. going with a founder or investing in a founder that we knew very well. Mm-hmm. Um, and that obviously could provide some comfort. I think the risk is, though, if you invest in someone super well and that money actually is meaningful to you, then um, if it doesn't go well, it may actually damage your personal relationship. relationship. <laughs> right? But that said, you shouldn't be investing any money in angels you can't afford to lose. And True. Then on that note, um, you know, people always ask me about, like, how is it investing with friends? Right, because there's obviously a risk to this. I've lived with you. I've lived with Jared, <laughs> um, and so like you know, there's a risk to that. So I guess like to you, like what has that been like? Ah, investing with, with investing with friends. Flipping it back on you. Oh <laughs> right, man. Whew. 
I mean, investing in friends is awesome, right? There's there's friends who you really trust. There's friends who you don't really trust. Yeah. But working... Are there, though? Real friends that you don't <laughs> trust? <laughs> well, <they're... laughs> Associates. Yeah, acquaintances. <laughs> acquaintances. Uh, working with friends is dope, man. I think to be able to uh, debunk the myth that working with friends is, is the worst thing to do, I think that's really cool. I think with us, we, we sharpen each other, right? Mm-hmm. We respect each other for our talents and our superpowers. And we also are like, oh, when you fall short, okay, you know, like we can help out. We're yeah. going to have a joke about it, but get it tight. Yeah. Get it right. Get it right. <laughs> a lot of those come from Henri. Yeah. <laughs> MD Henri. <laughs> and so to be able to have um, the ability to work with people who inspire you and the ability to people who hold you accountable, I think that that is rare. Yeah. And so I'm blessed to know you guys and to be able to work with you guys and to be able to put in blood, sweat, tears, and money. Yep. The things that really matter and time. A lot of These time. are the things that, that matter the most to us. And we talk to each other more than we talk to any of our significant others or family members. And I so, Don't tell them that, though. <laughs> <laughs> now they know. I feel like they, you have to know, right? <laughs> like anyone they, who's they been, see us I was say, anyone who's been around us is like, <laughs> So you work. Stop again. talking about it. I know. <laughs> so for us to to put aside our, you know, just like our own wants and our time and our effort and what have you, to spend it together to put it towards a mission that was initially about investing, but now is it about changing the face of entrepreneurship and just changing um, and investing in one thousand diverse entrepreneurs? I think to get to that point is amazing. So yeah. I commend you guys, and I thank you for letting me be along for the ride. So, moving on, we're going to talk about being an angel investor just in general. What does an angel investor mean? Yeah. Just like, hit me. What does it mean? What do you do? Uh, what's, what's, like a, what's just like the one-twos of being an angel investor? Kick it off? No, you go ahead for it. Um, so, I mean, angel investor is just somebody who has a certain amount of extra capital, money, and you want to invest your own personal dollars into businesses. We happen to be angel investors into startups at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, but when we first started, we invested in small businesses. We invested in real estate. So you can angel invest into many different asset classes, but people generally today consider it for startups. Yeah. Um, so whether it be 5000 10000 100000 you put into a business. Uh, and so I think that that's what the, the true definition of an angel investor. Obviously, if you're investing in startups, it's a riskier investment. So it makes more sense to invest in you know as many deals as possible. Because it's the law of numbers, but there's mm-hmm. a balance between uh, numbers and quality. So necessarily, if you have 100 investments, it doesn't mean you'll be better off than somebody who has 20 investments. Right. Um, so just not just spray and pray kind of game. You still want to have good quality, but you don't want to have you know one or two deals because right. uh, the odds just aren't in your favor. You still need to diversify yeah, you your still need portfolio. That, and that's true for every type of investment. Mm-hmm. You always want to diversify. I think a lot of people do have a misconception about how much money do I need to invest and then like how many deals should I invest in? I think mm-hmm. often people invest in too little deals and often people think they need too much money. I think both of those just aren't, aren't true. Wow. Wow. That's, that's good. I also think on top of angel investing, can you get an angel investing without having capital? I think you can by giving your talents. Yeah. So if you have expertise in consulting uh, in the background of finance, you can give that. If you were an engineer and you had front end, back end, full stack, you can give that, and you can get points, you can get carry, you get board seats, you can get advisory points yep. and stuff like that. So I think that's another part that we should say to the audience is that it doesn't have to be $10,000 or $25,000. If you have a skill that is undeniable that you can give to folks to get to the next level, you can have the opportunity to technically angel invest and get some carry. That's the whole point of angel investing yep. is to get a return. Or get points in the company equity stake. Did you did you have something you wanted to jump in on on angel sure, investor? Sure, I'm happy to. So maybe helpful to say like what the responsibilities are yes. for angel investor or what they I typically let, do. This you dynamic. Know, you so <laughs> actually, let me let me just break it down again. <laughs> so there, uh, oh, we we didn't talk about the how we split from five to four and brought on John, but we'll we'll still talk yeah, about we, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good thing we have people who can edit this. The team Harlem Capital right now is made up of four people. We have the New York office. We have the Boston office. <laughs> Temporary Boston office. Temporary Boston office <laughs> right now. The Boston office are the, the two gentlemen who, who did investment banking, private equity, and now they're at Harvard Business School. And so those are our hardcore finance guys. 
managing partners. And then the New York office is John Henry and myself, business backgrounds, but a lot of it has to do with media right now. Yep. We are venture partners. The difference between managing partners and venture partners. Managing partners, day-to-day -day responsibilities, salary, in the trenches, kicking ass, taking names. <laughs> venture partners, marketing, branding, deal sourcing, putting capital towards deals, and just just being great advisors. So I just wanted to put that part out yep. there just to make sure, because <laughs> having you two as managing partners and still being so different is is really great. Even though we have like very similar resumes. <laughs> On paper, we look similar. It's it's, totally but that's the same with John Henry and myself. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. We're so similar, yeah, so different. but so <laughs> different. And it's, we get to the point where it's just like, you know, we're both folks of color. We both do podcasts. We both do social media. We same both complex. Building. We both live in the same complex. <laughs> like, ah, but anyways. <laughs> All right. So now you're going to talk about your part about angel investing. Sure. So responsibilities. talk about the responsibilities or, or typical activities for angel investor. Mm -hmm. I think one is sourcing. So finding opportunities to invest in. This can be either getting referrals from your network. Mm -hmm. It can be, you know, proactively going out to events and trying to meet entrepreneurs. Then I think there's diligence. So whatever you need, it's your personal money as an angel investor mm -hmm. to to learn about the industry, about the company, about its history, about its growth trajectory, et cetera. Yeah. Um, you know, background checks on the founders, for example. Yeah. References. Um, yeah, references to basically say, hey, I think this is a good place to park my money. I feel good about the investment, you know, objectives. And then I think next is investing. So mm -hmm. actually closing Deploying the deal, capital. wiring the money, <laughs> and then on the back the wire. and then on the back end it's going to be value add portfolio management. So mm -hmm. seeing if there's any way you can be helpful to a company, it could be reviewing their financials, it could be suggesting new staff, it could be, you know, in, introducing them to new customers. Mm -hmm. But anyway, there's a lot there's a lot there. Um, but people invest as angels, I think some people invest to make money, or I think others invest to to learn. They want to be mm -hmm. involved in these new industries. They don't want to start a company themselves. They want to you know put their money behind someone else. And some people just want to network. So some people think it's cool to just have this other thing they do they can talk about at cocktail parties. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of different reasons that, that people angel with us. And that's awesome. an important point. One of my favorite quotes from Warren Buffett is, uh, you earn what you learn. And like you have to, yep. you got to pay to play, right? And I think we understood that, like to a certain extent, you know, we we're investing money, and if you know there's a possibility you'll lose it, and you have to be okay with that. Um, but I think you quickly realize the the learning experience of finding deals, diligent deals, talking to founders, the networks that you get access to. I mean, you just it's very different versus you know, obviously we've we've done well, but being an employee and trying to reach out to people is very different. Like, hey, mm -hmm. I'm managing this business, I have a couple of founders, like will you talk to me or would you be interested in looking at this deal and putting your own money to work? And so I think you really do have to take that risk sometimes of putting your own money and really taking that risk to learn and, and expand your network. Yeah, I think it's just like being having like a side hustle in general is like being an angel investor. You are a mentor told me you're building scar tissue. All right. Well, thank you for talking about angel investing. And now we're going to fast forward to brand building. In today's world, every single company is a media company, no matter what. And we eventually, and we talked about this um, before, we had all type of different names. Yeah. And then we somehow came up with Harlem Capital partners and then we eventually transitioned to just harlem capital because people couldn't take three words <laughs> harlem capital ventures harlem venture partners harlem it, i it's, people still can't get it harlem ventures i know it's that one <laughs> times. It's all good. Uh, but i think harlem capital shorting it was such a great move for us and Henri, we were talking offline about how we went from having five six people to now only having four and bringing on a new partner. And a lot of it was because of the different branding changes that were going through and how some people were working full time and couldn't have the opportunity to have their face on a website or to say that they were actually investing. So if you want to talk to that part a little bit about the brand building and how you came over this almost Chinese wall from not having a website, not being on Twitter, to not being focused on putting out what you do on social to now like everything you do you want to be putting out public yeah. speaking blah 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 well th that comes from living with you for four years <laughs> <laughs> um 
Yeah, I mean, we probably like three months after we started, we we decided to have the website. It definitely yeah. led to some confrontation internally from our original members. Um, some people didn't believe we needed it. A lot of venture capitalists don't have it. Uh, I think our perspective was, hey, like we're six young twenty-four-year-old brothers. Like we're not necessarily in the same position as other people, uh, and having a brand was important. So we decided to get business cards. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got the website. Um, eventually, we all along each part, people were like aching, yeah, and having a hard time. It business like cards? What we need business cards Jerry, for? Jerry wasn't on board either. Uh, time. You know, wasn't. website. <laughs> Why does my picture have to be because on the was. website, man? You wanted a bio? <laughs> Come on, bro. Yeah, you your bio, your bio is longer than mine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to add some context, I think we all had full time jobs at that point. I'm not sure if you started your entrepreneurial stuff. Yeah, I think I was in. I was at an agency, but okay, being in an agency. The reason why there was conflict is because in finance, there's just so many legal legalities, if you will, yep. of having your hands in other places. But even more realistically, I mean, that, that is a thing if you're at a bigger company, especially if they're public. But for us, we didn't have to worry about that as much. Well, I mean, it's the, some of the other partners. Yeah. Some of the other partners. Yeah. But for me, like, why I pushed back was, hey, like, I don't want my boss to think I'm distracted and not able to do well in work. Mm-hmm. We still got annual reviews, bonuses <laughs> on the line. We I, I, we were applying to business school. I wanted to write me a good recommendation, yeah. right? And so you'd have to think about all these things. But ultimately, once they knew what we were doing, they were very supportive and intrigued. I think some of them wish they were doing what we are doing. It, just two seconds about that. Can you guys talk about having a side hustle business while you are working full time? And on top of that, having a, a side hustle business that is not in competition, but in the exact same industry. Like how how did that go? What was the process? Just yep. quick points. Yeah. On that. So we initially told them you have to you have to disclose all your investments to finance firms. Um, so we disclose any investment we made through Harlem Capital. So that would mean like we send them the deck and say, hey, we're going to invest this much money. Here's what the business does. Do you think this is a conflict to our business? You know, fortunately, in private equity, businesses are much bigger, you know, 20 to $300 million of revenue mm-hmm. versus the businesses we invest in are, you know, 100000 to $3 million. Um, so never was really any competition, but our bosses always knew, you know, what investments we were making. And they, were, they had to give us clearance for that. I think uh, they definitely probably thought we were doing less work than we probably were in terms of like how much we were doing for Harlem Capital. Mm -hmm. And I think it's now pretty obvious, like they see our deck, they know how much work we were doing over the past two years. Um, But I think it's just a balance between kind of letting your your team know, but not necessarily opening up the full book and showing them like, hey, I'm working on this every night for four hours. (laughs) And it just required a lot of prioritization. So obviously we did delicate dance with disclosing Mm -hmm. how much time we were spending on it. (laughs) But I think it just came down to, hey, when you had important stuff at work, like you're closing a deal, yep. you have a big memo or presentation, you're just going to focus on that for that couple of days. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, when you're having a busy time with your angel investing, you're about to close the angel deal, then you'll spend more time on that. And what worked out well for us is because we were a group, we could kind of play off each other. So we usually wouldn't be all busy at the same time. And so mm-hmm. we would hold each other up, understand that some people will fall off the grid and some others will carry the weight. And that's all through like communication, like over communicating yep. with folks mm-hmm. was something that we had prided ourselves. And on. that was the that was the pivot to Slack. Mm-hmm. That really that and, really and changed Slack the is game. probably our number one most used tool. Um, and if folks don't know what Slack Slack is, it's like a communication tool for teams, especially teams that are like remote, yep. don't necessarily see each other in the office every day, and have a lot of deliverables and different conversations going on. Much 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 better than. I am group me email text. email text, and so it, it's just a great way to carp, uh, compartmentalize. Compartmentalize. <laughs> great way to keep shit together. <laughs> keep that in there. Yeah, <laughs> and it's searchable, which makes you yeah. and it's searchable. Uh, and it's free yep. until you like go yeah, over. Like <laughs> uh, okay, so we were talking about building a brand. Okay. So we had six people initially uh, for first investment. Once we went to our second investment, we lost a soldier yep. investing in a small business. Uh, it didn't align with one of our partners. So we're at five. And then was it post our third investment? We started having only four? No, we added one. We added John. And then ah. we dropped two. Cool. So what's the process of adding a new teammate? I'm curious. Yeah, so John, who will be back next week, <laughs> yep. uh, we had met him in late 2016. Mm-hmm. John uh, Henry. Founder, John Henry, and he lived a block away from me, Brandon and I. 
we just kind of kicked it, got to know each other, you know, eventually made sense based on what he was doing and what we were doing Mm -hmm. to kind of merge forces. And so we came to agreement and said, hey, you know, in this new entity, what percentage of ownership would you have? What are the requirements? Uh, And it was a lot of back and forth. And when you're starting off the relationship, uh, you kind of started as friends, now your business partners, you can get kind of serious. Mm-hmm. Uh, and certain partners on the original team, you know, didn't want to give as much up. And other partners thought that, you know, John should get more. And so I think that that's something that you have to go through as a team. And once you get through it, you realize like you can actually negotiate, communicate, because that's, that's the hardest part is cutting the dollars up between each other. Yeah. And, it, and it, as an angel investor or an angel syndicate, as, as we were, dollars kind of have like a, yeah. they have a really big part because you aren't doing this full time, you are just basically deal sourcing and investing in deals. There's no money coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's just like, wow. What are the only two metrics? Are you bringing deals, and are you in writing larger checks? Yeah. And so that end up being like a differentiation um, of characteristics of like why we should bring on John, why he should have this much, and how we move forward. And I wanted to clarify a point. So. As angels, it was just, hey, you invest this dollar amount and then you own this much of the companies that we've invested mm-hmm. in. Um, but where it got tricky about money economics is as we're thinking about scaling from an angel investment syndicate to an actual fund. Yep. And how do we want to share the various you know fees and revenues you get exactly. from that? And how do we lose the two people, the final two? Yeah, so the final two, I mean, one decided... So as you we were changing... It was clear that this was going to become something larger that could take up, you know, a full time mm-hmm. opportunity for us. Um, and so one one guy he decided he wanted to run his own public equities fund, focus on something else. Mm-hmm. And so this no longer was an alignment. So he did want to hold on to the investments that he made with us. Yep. But he knew he couldn't devote a lot of time or energy to this, and that ne- wasn't necessarily bought into the long term vision. Um, and the other one, you know, he's in law school and saw a conflict with his ability to take the bar exam and you know pursue jobs that way mm-hmm. and so it just made sense to kind of agree to disagree in part ways that said we're still having great relationships with these guys mm-hmm. we hang out um and it, i think that has a lot to do with the foundation and the level of trust that we had in the beginning mm-hmm. knowing that hey if this doesn't work out we'll still be able to uh be friends yeah. and, and kind of treat each other fairly yeah and it's brick by brick i mean people invest alongside friends all the time do they actually create funds and businesses out of them not necessarily, but investing in a good opportunity is is still a feasible thing to do without having a, yeah. a ton of energy put towards it. Um, and then I guess the last thing I want to just talk about in terms of building a brand, like how important is it for us to build our brand externally through media, through press, through this compared to, you know, 10 20 years ago. This is a good question for you to answer. Yeah, this is you. Well, you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a plant. <laughs> cool. Well, I, the reason why I brought it up is because you, you, I feel like you guys were so traditional. Yep. And you guys now yeah. are... Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yep. So, um, for me, building a brand is huge. You have folks who are out here who are solo founders who do this on the side who have built such a brand on LinkedIn mm-hmm. or Twitter or Instagram, and they're being able to just literally document what they do. They're not necessarily creating new things, but they're documenting their experience, their process, the investments that they're making, and the impact. And just by the sheer fact of doing that, they get to win the game because other people aren't doing it. Um, Also because older folks may not see the value in it. And so for us to be able to build that brand, I think it, it gives us a chance to catapult ourselves above a lot of competition and it gets us great traction and that all leads into deal flow of us getting a lot more deals and partnerships with accelerators investors upstream and downstream and then i also think it helps us with investing as well in terms of like lps who could invest into the fund we have a lot of folks who we talk to who can keep up with us whether it's a lp newsletter instagram twitter linkedin articles forbes mentions black enterprise people would inbound us code people who we already knew would reach out to us as well and so i think just media is so it's such a key tool yeah. to making it to the next level from being an angel investor or being part of angel syndicate and making it to have your own fun yeah. yeah and the one point i would add to that is i guess coming from traditional where like we weren't supposed to post uh work stuff on facebook <laughs> etc we have access when we were in banking we did not have access to social media. Anything. Nope. 
You no websites. There's people who I sent the link, like uh, some of our buddies who still work at uh, Bank of America, couldn't look at the link at work yep. mm-hmm. for uh, Dachshund because it's blocked. Yep. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and so I think coming from that, I mean, after living with you for four years and seeing the power of content and then, you know, with John coming on the team, obviously two people who very value the content. Mm-hmm. Uh, the thing that's important for me is, like, just being visible to the community. And I spoke about this last week at Northside Festival. Um, just like making sure people of color and women know that we exist. There's somebody out there for you, mm-hmm. you know, who wants to invest in you. You can take the risk to be a founder. Like that's a culture change. And like uh, a week ago, we just got our Harlem Capital gear, and my girlfriend was wearing our Harlem Capital <laughs> sweatshirt. And this guy ran up to her at the train station and was like, "Hey, like you work at Harlem Capital?" She's like, "No, my boyfriend's a founder." And he gave her the business card. He was excited, and it's like that. That is like that's a brand, right? That's powerful. Mm-hmm. Like not many people of color no major banks outside of like the Goldman Sachs and Bank of America, if they even know those, let alone know a bank that's a, owned by a minority, mm-hmm. right? Like how many people know Aereo Investments in Chicago, yeah. which is one of the largest black owned banks. And then were they willing to run up to you because you have that bank logo on your sweatshirt? Or like that's how you like change a mm-hmm. culture and a shift. And I think that's the power of the brand that we're creating is like we're trying to actually make the community open to this experience, want to know about investing, think that it's sexy, exciting, and want to get involved. I think that's a very different experience versus being very traditional, being 45, being rich, nobody knows who you are, mm-hmm. you're doing deals, but Low it's key. like you're not, you're not <laughs> exciting and accelerating the pipeline. And our hope is as we grow, we can accelerate founders of color to want to do this because they see us doing this and they see other people doing this. I think that's the beauty of the brand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, those are great points. I mean, being visible has helped us a ton. <laughs> so as y'all are alluding to, you know, we are able to set an example and empower people and show them that, hey, there's somebody here for you. Mm-hmm. And it helps out on the sourcing side, as you were, you were mentioning, because we're visible, people can send us mm-hmm. deals. Uh, but one of the nicest things about venture that allows to be visible without any issue is really that, like, you're not competing for deals. Like, any any company raising venture capital, um, they're usually taking money from several different VC firms, several different angels. Mm-hmm. And so if you're trying to make a very large investment, yes, maybe there's some competition there. But usually, um, you're better off just having more people kind of focus on your same mission because it proves that one is viable and it also is in the best interest of the founders and we're able to grow grow the pie, right? If we have mm-hmm. more people, people of color, women starting companies, we're all going to be better off. Yeah, and I think this that's an amazing point. Like Being able to have a brand specifically as a venture capital fund, it builds good relationships with colleagues and players in the industry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And venture capital is a contact sport. Absolutely. So if you can't be able to shoot an email to someone else and ask why they passed on a deal or why they think this is a good investment, then you are, you know, left outside and blind. And you may make the wrong decisions with your money or someone else's money. So, guys, thank you for talking about team building, brand, angel investing, LLC, all these jazzy things. This was a special edition for the Chop It Up show. Uh, and so now we're going to have our question of the week. Question of the week is, what is keeping you from investing, if not even just saving extra capital? Most people in the U.S. right now are not even safe, which is pretty dire. And so I'm going to answer that question right now. What's, or And then people who have invested or who, people who have saved a lot, what made you want to do that? So for me, I have invested a little bit and saved a little bit. And the reason that... that I wanted to do that is because my parents and everyone who was in my community never had any extra funds to grab from when I went to school or when I needed X, Y, and Z. And so I wanted to do that for my family. And so when Henri hit me up and asked me about investing, I was like, yes, let's go, let's go, let's go. And then in terms of actually saving money, I use Acorns, which is a really cool app that you can save as you swipe. So every time I swipe my card, I get a roundup put into my savings account. You can also create an IRA through that as well. And so this week, if you have a chance, answer the question of what is keeping you from investing or saving, or if you have invested and saved, what was the reason, what was the trigger that made you do it? All right, guys, we're signing off. I am BB. HPJ. JT. Peace. Peace.